I'd like to acknowledge my uh, team members there of Bill Bowden, Gray Polish, Katie Hill, Stephen Davies, and Craig Scanlon, well, mainly from the, uh, the uh, DAFWA uh, group, but a few others as well. Um, the key messages, I, I thought I'd start off with them, is really the wetting agents can be effective and economical, uh, but timing, as we found it with respect to rainfall, uh, tended to be important. The use of a moldboard plough while eliminating or reducing non-wetting created sometimes sort of not yet fully understood problems. And lifting the soil pH to about, above 4.8 in combination with soil cultivation maximised the yield in the forest gravels. When we look at non-wetting soils, it, 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 it is a typical issue where the, the soil um, obviously doesn't wet up. But you, you can see, in, um, like in this slide, um, the, um, the puddling, puddles that appear and then as well as um, very dry sand uh, right next to it. It's a delayed germination of weeds in crops and pastures, reduced nutrient availability um, and, and leading on from that is the increased risk of wind and water erosion. Um, when we look at the forest gravels, as, as Bill pointed out uh, yesterday when he talked about the gravels, it's really focusing on the, um, the area of the old forest uh, around the Albany Highway and then a bit further up towards 2J there. So it's, it's quite a, a large chunk of the agricultural areas and they, they consist of, of uh, particularly the, uh, the gravels. Um, the soil types are, are usually loamy to shallow gravelly duplexes uh, and variable range of uh, phosphorus buffer index of 10 to 300 it usually locates in the, is located in the high rainfall area, so rainfall doesn't tend to be in, um, as much as a limiting factor. The, uh, the productivity potential is high, but at the same time, you can find some very uh, poorly producing areas, as, as you can see on that slide, that was taken in the middle of July in, uh, near Dark in 2010. At the same time, well, not the same time, in the subsequent years, you can have four and a half tons to the hectare uh, uh, yields just further down the road. The soil constraints are usually uh, probably not limited to gravel, non-wetting and, and water logging. Those tend to uh, or can go hand in hand. But the, um, when we look at the gravels, it, it, um, when Bill talks about gravel, it's sort of anything larger than two mil. But there's a large range in, in the gravels, obviously, from anything from uh, um, you know, more than two mil, but going up to, to 10 or 20 mils as well. So within a one paddock, you, you can find a, a large range of, of gravels that just the distribution of the gravel of larger than two mil. Um, across a whole paddock, you, you can see the differences there at the surface, uh, very coarse gravel versus very uh, small gravel. When we look at the, uh, the non-wetting properties of the gravel, we found quite a, a distinct difference between the, the non-wetting, which is expressed as the uh, MED. The MED is like a measure of non-wetting, and MED of zero is, is wettable, fully wettable, and MED of five is, is severely non-wetting. So the MED, it is variable across the surface, but it, it tends to be much lower at the, right at the surface compared to an, an um, at, at a depth of two centimetres and then a bit less again at a depth of five to ten centimetres. But again, the distribution is there right across uh, the area. When we look at the, the gravel content, then um, we, we split up the, um, the texture classes of, of the soil, anything less than 20 micron, so it really defines the 200 micron, the 600 micron, and then the two mil five and ten mil, we found quite a distinct difference between the, the, the surface, the, the two centimetre and the five centimetre. There were much more uh, very coarse gravels in the, in the top, right at the surface compared to the five centimetres, and then uh, with many more fines um, in, the, uh, in, in, the, in the greater depth. So and the, the fines have been washed out to a greater depth, but not only that, the actual non-wetting properties of the fines have changed uh, with depth. Right here at the surface, the, the MED of the fines is about 3.5, but further down in the profile, 
um, they were um, or there in the profile. Um, they are, you know, just under the three, and then the the MEDs of the the 600 uh, microns is substantially less than the the fines. But again, there is a difference there in in the, in depth. So when we look at managing water repellency, um, Paul has mentioned quite a few uh, mitigation and amelioration uh, options, and um, I'll be looking at two or three of these, particularly with respect to the gravels. When we look at wetting agents, they all work, well, most of them work, and this is just a quick video as to where you can see how they work. We have an, a control where of a non-wetting sand, then we had one puff of a bit of wetting agent applied right to the surface, and you can see from the contact angle of the the water on this on the soil it's quite different from the control and then we have three puffs of wetting agent and the water goes straight in so it, there is certainly and definitely an, a wetting agent effect there but there is also an, a rate effect so these wetting agents were tested in the lab in small plots and large strip trials in the lab we uh, we used little petri dishes looking at about six or seven different wetting agents and the majority of them worked and the, the odd one did not work. Um, in, the, in the field we had the small plot trials, here we are bending the wetting agents with it just manually, not behind the bar, but just uh, a little setup that we uh, have with a knapsack where you dribble straight after seeding, you dribble in the wetting agent. And then the larger plot trials uh, that we conducted um, around the country where well, we had different rates of a particular wetting agent um, right across the whole paddock. Well, the, the results of some of the lab tests, we had, without going and mentioning brand names, the number three didn't perform well at all. We have the D and the W at the end here, that's uh, just straight detergent from the supermarket, and that's water. So you can see that this particular wetting agent didn't do much better than the straight water, but the rest, so this is the infiltration time it takes for an, a droplet of water to infiltrate the, the dish. So that was fairly rapid everywhere except for, for these and this particular one and then the, the water. With the, the results of some of the small plot trials, we found the, the, um, these are the, uh, the, the yield results of, the, uh, of about seven uh, or six different uh, plot, uh, small plot trials uh, across the, the Great Southern with a number of different wetting agents that are commercially available. Uh, this is the control and only in two uh, locations did we measure a significant increase in the yield compared to the control. The rest of them um, the control was, was sort of either uh, usually a bit larger than some of the, the wetting agents. So it was really only in two occasions that we measured an, a response not so much between the wetting agents, but between the control and the wetting agents. Uh, th these two, um, the wetting agents were applied very shortly before a rainfall event, so it happened to be that way, and, and, and that's where we measured an, an a significant increase, and hence our, one of our conclusions of perhaps trying to apply these wetting agents before or shortly before rainfall. The results of the large uh, strip trial we, um, there wasn't so much a difference between the, the yield in the different strips, but we also did a survey across the whole paddock of the amount of gravel that we uh, could see at the surface. And we, so that's the amount of visible, the percentage of visible gravel at the surface. And that ranged from, let's say, 10 to close to 100. And then you, uh, correlating that to the yield of the yield map, for each class of visible gravel, we found quite a significant increase in the yield in the, in the highest class of gravel of the wetting agents. Across the rest of the paddock, it didn't seem to matter greatly uh, what happened there. It was done in 2011, which wasn't a particularly wet or, or dry uh, year. So in this particular case, the, the, um, the wetting agent in the area of the, with a lot of gravel right at the surface scored particularly uh, well. So one of our conclusions was there, if you knew where the gravel was and you applied a wetting agent to that area, you could um, 
you, you could gain you know, $480 by spending $100 on, on some wetting agent in that particular area. So it was a very clear illustration where it did work and, and this is just the visible um, sign of that. Well, the, the, the management of the forest gravels, um, we did quite a lot of work around quartering on, on properties of uh, Tim and Ray Harrington. And we had a number of treatments there. We focused on the, on the forest gravels. We had um, several treatments that ran for a few years. Uh, we had an, an organic nutrient uh, application there. We had lime. We had lime with mold boarding um, and a bit of scarifying. We had some wetting agents. And then we had claying. We were too late to use the local clay source, so we just bought some bentonite from Waterloo that was applied like, uh, like lime, and it did have an, a liming uh, effect as well. In the second year, we, did a not, we continued that. Uh, we didn't reapply the wetting agents. We didn't do anything. We just continued the trial. We in, in, uh, started up a new trial in 2010 with more boarding lure, pre and post seeding and, and an application of bentonite. Uh, there were three reps. The first one was 70 meters long. The second one was uh, 200 meters long. So the mold boarding, uh, we were pretty keen to see that work in that area because you, you, know, you eliminate the, uh, the non-wetting completely. But it, uh, to our surprise, it led to a few other issues that we had not anticipated at all. The, um, the activity itself went quite well. Um, as you can see here. Um, then we it came to germination and this isn't the, um, the control germinated where you can see the clear uh, lines of germinating crops and then we didn't see anything happening on the mole boarded plots for quite some time. So that was a bit of a concern so the establishment was severely affected in the mole boarded plots. Uh, last year in 2010, uh, 2013, where we went somewhere else, we did again see quite an, an, an effect of um, or poor germination on the on the mole boarded plots, and at some stage I started to measure the soil temperature, and on this during the day we measured 13 degrees in the mole boarded plots. They they were very wet, uh, much wetter than the control, which was a non-wetting gravel. Um, and we measured 21 degrees uh, right next to it in the, in the stubble retained uh, dry non-wetting gravel. So it was a very different uh, temperature regime in the mold boarded plots versus the non-wetting plots. This is another thing we found where we plowed up different uh, soil types, the gravel versus white sand. We could see a good establishment there on the, of the canola in the white sand on the gravel but not on the white sand. That, that was not at the Harringtons, but it, uh, that was somewhere else in, in Franklin. And then we found also the small changes in, in soil type brought up by the ploughing, uh, some gravel here versus the white sand there, massive differences in, in crop vigour and, and even establishment. So it, there were still a, quite a few issues there with the, non, the, uh, the mole boarding. At the result of all that, uh, in quartering, um, the control did extremely well, 4.8. The bentonite treatments out yielded that, but not significantly. It was pretty hard to beat the, the Harringtons on their, on their own game, going at uh, that sort of yields. We did uh, significantly, um, yeah, there was a significant difference, but that, that was worse in the mold boarded plus lime and so on. So uh, the, the second year, Again, the, the bentonite was, was very good. The control was right up there, but the lure, the wetting agents were, uh, that one in particular did exceptionally well. And there was a second year effect, so that wasn't reapplied. The pH change was quite dramatic. If we look at the, the bentonite effect here, we had more than a unit and a half difference with that sort of rates of bentonite. And then the MED, the non-wetting properties, markedly changed in the mole board as you would expect and not much change anywhere else. So the non-wetting certainly changed with the, uh, the mole boarding but not so much the, the yield and the establishment. The, the second trial we had here, the, the bentonite um, did, did very well. The control was 2.2 and then mole boarded again yielded a bit less. The highest yielding one was the lure 
post seeding, and even though that wasn't significant, it was still there. The, the MED initially it was 4.2, and then it dropped to 1.1 over the season. So it, not only you're dealing with an, with spatial um, spatial changes, you're, you're also dealing with temporal changes. Well, if we look at the crop nutrition of the forest gravels, well, one of the aspects is is the very high PBI or, or the ability of the soil to lock to hold on to the to the um, uh, to the phosphorus. So we measure high phosphorus soil test P levels, but these soils are still very responsive. And, and Bill started some work there in, in the darkened area um, some years ago, where he looked at, at that, and, and his thinking was. Well, maybe changing the non-wetting properties by cultivating and liming, maybe we we're able to free up some of the, the locked up pea um, by doing that, by improving the, uh, the root development. So what, we, uh, what he did, this is in summary, I just want to pay your attention here to, we had in, um, in the light blue columns, that's the no lime uh, treatments, then in the, the red ones are the, the lime treatments, then we have in cultivation and no, no cultivation and um, with cultivation and we had a few different rates of P. I'm only presenting the two here, the two extremes, the zero and the 30. Well, the, the main thing is really the cultivation effect that occurred um, right in 2010. In a dry year, we had a massive cultivation effect here. Adding lime um, changed the whole picture right across the, uh, the years, so, and, and that, that lime surely changed the pH there. The, um, in the last one, we did pick up a wetting agent effect there uh, for good measure. In the last one, um, what we were hoping for was the cultivation uh, by itself would out yield the, um, the addition of the, of the P, but that did not, not happen. So uh, the, in 2012, we, uh, the cultivation and the lime did not seem to replace the, the additional P. So it, what, we, what we saw in the field was sort of reflected in the pH is adding the lime was a substantial change there in the, um, in the, in the pH. Um, a similar thing was found elsewhere on the same farm, but the, um, where we found an, a massive change in the, um, in the lime uh, in the pH following the lime treatment to the extent that um, by going from the, the control by adding lime we increased the yield from 1.4 to, uh, to uh, 4 and that, that was even visible um, right towards the end of the season where you saw some very poorly yielding uh, control strips even though they, they had received uh, P up front uh, by the farmer. Um, so that really explains it, it here, where we found an, an, a change in pH dropping below 4.8, we found a massive increase in aluminium and keeping the pH up to that sort of levels of 4.8, um, the, uh, the yields were certainly uh, secured. So keeping the pH to that level uh, was essential. And the last one, we, we extended that work to Franklin, where we had a cultivation by lime, by fertilizer uh, replication um, on, an, on a bigger scale, where we had some cultivation with some shallow disks and some mole boarding. And then um, these are the results. Uh, we had a cultivation effect there. We had a lime effect um, of 0.2. And then we had also a fertilizer effect across those strips. If you put it all together, we, we were hoping that by cultivating and liming, we could um, increase these yields for a very low rate of fertilizer, but that did not seem to happen. You know, there wasn't quite a significant fertilizer effect there as well. So just by adding the, the lime and the cultivation, it didn't seem to uh, repeat the, um, the changes that we found in Darken. That are the, the pH changes that, that happened after the lime application so that that all made sense so the um yeah in, in conclusion the, these are really the uh, the, the take-home messages here the wetting agents can be effective and economical with time uh, but timing with respect to rainfall appear to be essential 
or critical. The use of a mole board, we did find some, some improvements as, as the last one showed there in Franklin, but at, there at Quartering we found some uh, significant problems. But, and then in summary, lifting the pH to about 4.8 with the soil cultivation had and, uh, and certainly maximised the yield in these forest gravels. I have to leave it at that, thank you. I, um, when Bill started off that work in Darken, he used two different lime sources, the quick lime as, an, as a quick way of um, getting some, some liming response as well as some lime sand. Um, the, the biggest improvement we saw immediately, or he saw immediately, was by using the high lime or the, the builder's lime. Later on, the, 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 um, the lime sand started to kick in and we started to see that type of responses as well. So the, the response in the first year was brought about by the quick lime or the high lime. In the, in the subsequent years, the lime sand started to kick in and uh, that's when um, yeah, some significant yield increases were uh, reported as well. The, the last one where I showed the, um, we more or less had abandoned the, the plot, but the, the farmer rang up and he said, come and have a look, you can still see the treatments in the field. The, these lime treatments were applied in 2009, and that was um, with normal lime sand. So, um, yeah, as I said, the quick response was gained by the high lime or the, the builder's lime, the slower one, st but still effective with the lime sand. Plowing was done pretty dry, uh, dry at the surface, so what we were bringing up was still fairly damp gravel, um, and the lime was applied before plowing. So, um, but the, the the lime or the topsoil in general, it's not it's not flipped 180 degrees, so you you lay it down in layers. So there's quite a good transition of of lime sort of distributed across the the profile over the, the plowing depth. Yeah. My, my experience, from, particularly from the South Coast, I mean, Steve probably can, can um, speak for the rest of the, the state, but my experience with the, the mole boarding, particularly along the South Coast, has been quite variable from more or less disasters to w with very little uh, germination on particularly white sand in, with canola to some quite respectable uh, increases in, in yield in the first year, in the second year, and even the, the third year. So um, it's a bit of a mixed bag. Um, even in, in this presentation here, the, the Franklin treatments showed up a very marked uh, ploughing effect. On the same farm where we did bring up some white sand, there was absolutely nothing growing. Um, so we'll be trying to clay that, those areas in and, and hopefully improve those. So, but. The, the general response to ploughing has been fairly positive.